Namaste. So I'm getting ready uh, for a couple of weeks at the beach. Fur is flying. Stuff is going in suitcases. <laughs> so I'm going to try to do one more video before I hit the road or, or hit the airways. And this is going to be about Jing. Last time we talked about the three treasures, Jing, Qi, and Shen. Now we're going to in investigate each one individually. So the word Jing in Chinese can mean a bunch of different things depending on context. But specifically, we're going to talk about Jing as a noun. In that sense, it means essence, the essence of something. It's called the Jing. Okay, The essence is the concentrated nature of a thing that makes it what it is. Uh, in, in other words, the metaphysical or uh, yeah, philosophical meaning of Jing is very similar to the meaning of Dharma. Dharma, really the essence of the word Dharma means that which is the way it is, and why it is the way it is, or how it became the way it is. And jing means something very similar. It means like, like the smallest particle of a thing that retains all the qualities of a thing, which, by the way, is the definition of an element. So jing is an element in Chinese yoga. Uh, and it can mean something spiritual or material depending on the nature of the being that we're talking about. So for human beings, Jing means almost exactly sperm or semen, sexual fluids, whether male or female, that which is emitted during orgasm. <laughs> Jing is very important. Jing is like the fuel. Uh, if your body is compared to a nuclear reactor, <laughs> Jing would be the fuel rods. Okay. Uh, uh, humor is intentional. <laughs> so when the fuel rods get hot... <laughs> no, wait a minute. Let's not go there. Uh, <laughs> we're going to cover that in a later episode. <laughs> so the Jing... Uh, like we said last time, Jing is present in a certain quantity per unit of time, per day, per week, or whatever, however you want to measure it. You have a certain amount of Jing, which the body can manufacture from food. That's why this body is called the food body. Food, both uh, solid and liquid, and even air, uh, breathing, is considered a kind of food. And more, e more subtle than that, the impressions gathered through the senses are also food. They're food for our inner life, uh, isn't it? So the food gets converted into the essence of a human being. The essence of a human being is sperm or egg and the sexual fluids and hormones and nutrients that go along with that. Why is that? Because the sperm and the egg are the smallest particles of a human being that retain all the qualities of the human being. There's a wonderful dialogue between Nachiketan and his father, his, who is also his guru, in the Upanishads. And the son is asking, Father, what is Brahman? What is Brahman? I, I can't, it's so subtle, I can't even perceive it. And the father says, well, you can perceive it by its effects. Look at this existence, this wonderful universe. Huh? This is all manifested from Brahman. And the boy says, I still don't understand. <laughs> so the father says, bring me the seed of an Amalaki tree, a Banyan tree. So the boy goes and he brings the, the seed pod. Huh? 
And in the seed pod are like thousands of tiny seeds, smaller than a mustard seed. So the father takes one of the tiny, tiny seeds and he says, this is the essence of a whole banyan tree. Yet it's very tiny, very simple thing. Huh? So in the same way that jing, the, the sperm and the egg, are the essence of a human being. And when they're watered and cultivated in the proper way, they grow into a human being. Okay? Whew, I could go off on a whole riff here about the prenatal stage of existence and how it shapes our personality and our sexuality and so many other things about us. Uh, but briefly, the journey of the fertilized egg from the uh, fallopian tube to the, where the placenta takes root in the womb is fraught with all kinds of dangers and difficulties. Uh, the egg is a, just a microscopic cell. Even the fertilized egg, before it begins to grow, it has to find a place to gain nutrients. Okay, So, of course, the wall of the uterus is, the, is where it tries to find a place to implant and begin to form the placenta by which the fetus sucks energy. Huh? Now, it's very interesting that the umbilical cord is very long and the mother's birth, uh, blood pressure and lymph pressure are insufficient to push the nutrients all the way to the fetus. So the fetus has to do a certain uh, abdominal motion to actually suck the nutrients from the mother. And this, uh, interestingly enough, <laughs> is also seen in belly dancing. <laughs> and it's even an exercise in yoga. Okay? Some of the bandhus, the uh, breath exercises, where you breathe out all the way and then move the abdominal muscles in a certain pattern. Those are exactly the same movements as the fetus, sucking the energy and nutrients from the mother. <clears throat> so during this time, the fetus is extremely uh, vulnerable. And there's all kinds of bacteria and worms and protozoa and, and, and all kinds of nasty <laughs> creatures there. Uh, and that's the reason why many pregnancies don't take. They're unable to successfully implant in the womb of the uterus. Uh, so this is a, a, an episode in everyone's background that contains probably uh, dozens of traumas, uh, especially during sexual activity by the pregnant mother. Okay, and then the content, especially the verbal content and the energetic content of the recordings of these incidents is impressed upon the cellular structure of the fetus. And then later in life, as the body grows, it grows, replicates that pattern uh, uh, fractally through the entire body. This is called cellular memory. And cellular memory and cellular communication are a fact, uh, in, uh, especially in the early stage of biological life, any biological life. Uh, there's an extreme amount of information being passed back and forth uh, by the cells, biochemically, and even with s tiny, tiny pulses of laser light. There's, it's been observed. Nobody knows how it's happening, but it's happening. Uh, somehow the cells make little semiconductors and, and you know, semiconductor lasers. You know, it's mind-boggling. Nature is so sophisticated, way ahead of our technology. <laughs> so why don't we embrace the natural technology instead of these stupid machines? You know, I don't get it. People are really stupid. <laughs> Just because they're offered these things, you know, they accept them without ever thinking whether or not that's a good idea. See, and I blame the scientists. <clears throat> the scientists are no longer wise. 
They may be intelligent, but not wise. Because just because you can build a nuclear bomb doesn't mean you should build a nuclear bomb. And these ethical considerations are at the root, or these ethical misjudgments are at the root of all the problems facing society today. The thoughtless, witless, mindless adoption of new technology before its downsides, its long-term consequences are fully understood. This is extremely incautious. Huh? And as, as the guy, what's his name, who discovered anti-fragility? Uh, I forget his name right at the moment. But he also discovered that these unforeseen consequences of risky technologies, such as biotechnology, you know, uh, genetic engineering and so on, are, are going to come back to bite us. Huh? And they bite us by causing system crashes. Every complex system has uh, probably an unlimited number of undiagnosed failure modes. I mean, I was around, I was, I was a, a technician for Hewlett Packard working on early computer systems, data acquisition research computer systems and stuff like that. And, uh, <laughs> Man, those things could break in ways that you could never predict. I know, because I've been in the engineering, in the pits of the engineering uh, uh, R&D process, even done a bit myself. And you just can't imagine how many things can go wrong. You know, Murphy's Law rules. And so far, biological life is the only form of manifestation that displays the trait of adaptability, right? So we survive, but our machines will not because any little change in the circumstances, in the conditions, they fail to work. <laughs> so anyway, animals are reliable. If you know how to use them, you can do so many things. You can do magic. Uh, but people have lost this magic because they've lost their connection with nature due to dualist philosophy, Christianity especially, sees man in opposition, in conflict with nature. Man is to rule nature and to exploit nature. Huh? This whole hierarchical male dominant society, exploitative, bullying society that's all over the world now. This was invented by the dualistic philosophers. Before that, like India was a decentralized agrarian village network. Uh, and occasionally some people would get out of line and the kings would have to go recruit an army and, you know, put them down. But other than that, Life went on day by day in a natural way according to the seasons for thousands and thousands of years. And that's being lost. Although here in South India, the reason I live in South India is because that culture still exists here. The whole rest of the world could fall apart and South India and Sri Lanka would remain self-sufficient, at least agriculturally. And that's what counts. You can't eat nuts and bolts. You can't eat computer chips. You can't eat software, especially. So all that conditional technology is going to fail someday. You know, any uh, strong pulse from the sun, an EMP, electromagnetic pulse from the sun, could fry the whole thing in a few seconds. It could happen any time. And it will happen someday. Huh? We just don't know when. So the risk that they're taking, knowing this, you know, the risk that they're taking is that it won't happen in our lifetimes. And that's actually, you know, the pretty good odds. But <laughs> if the black swan flies, look out. There can be a crash, a system crash. A systemic crash of the entire society. This happened in North America 
uh, just after the pilgrims landed and their diseases propagated through the Native American community. Uh, maybe 80, 90 percent of the population of the entire North American continent was lost. Something similar happened in South America. Again, with the landing of the Spaniards. You see? So even just a stray virus can cause the complete collapse of civilizations. And with everything so interconnected with the Internet of Things, man, it's really scary, you know? Uh, there's a beautiful uh, simile by uh, one of the Taoist writers. I don't know if it's Lao Tzu, but any one of them. Uh, Huang Tzu, I think. Huang Tzu said, It was very kind of the emperor of China to wrap the whole country up in a bundle so a thief could come and steal it. See? If all the power in the country is invested in the leader, if something happens to the leader, then the, the country is basically foobar. <laughs> right? So it's very easy then for some rascal to come in and take over. And this has happened so many times in human history. So what we're getting at is each individual has to have their own connection with the truth, their own connection with reality, right? And this comes about through preservation of the jing, right? Or rather the energy to achieve such states comes from this fundamental source. So the jing, the, the original qi is also sometimes called original jing. The original jing is in the system we're studying, is stored in the kidneys. So there are several different kinds of uh, exercises and practices to store the original jing. And the, probably the most important of them is restricting the amount and frequency of ejaculation. There must be a, enough supply of jing to support the original qi, the original jing inherited from the parents, without having to draw on it. Huh? It's like having a bank balance and not having to live off it or take a loan. Huh? Having, managing your cash flow so that it's always positive. See? It's, it's sex economics, just as Wilhelm Reich explained. So managing the jing is an important part of the, ta of the tantric or uh, Taoist sex practices. In other words, to put it in a, in a nutshell, you can have as much sex of any kind, any flavor, any taste as you want. Just don't have an orgasm. Well, don't have an ejaculatory orgasm. See, you can learn to have energy orgasms that are just as satisfying without leaking the jing. And this is the art, this is the practice of Tantra, and we're going to study all this in the next series <laughs> when we study internal qigong. Om Tat Sat. Voodoo Saranai.